The guardians of this land, the Maori, have a rich and powerful culture full of mystique and an oral history that tells of a colorful and ancient past. The official story is that New Zealand was uninhabited 800 years ago when a fleet of seven canoes arrived from the Central Pacific. But a strange thing happened when they got to New Zealand. Their culture changed significantly. They built planked houses with decorative facades, used single canoes instead of outriggers, fashioned terraced village sites with amphitheatres and created complex art forms not seen anywhere else in the Pacific. So what made them change? Was it merely the difference in climate? Or was it that they were influenced by people who were already living here? There are legendary stories of little blonde fairy people living in hobbit-like burrows and red-haired giants thundering across the landscape. Do these have any factual basis or are they all just fairy stories? In this documentary, we're going to explore a much deeper history in New Zealand. A history that explains who these blonde and red-haired people were, where they came from and why they are rarely seen today. The answers to these questions may well surprise you. Let's start with a well-known Kiwi legend about the blonde-haired fairy people of the forest. When the Māori first arrived here, the first canoe was the Arawa canoe to land here. Captain was Tamata Kapua, who's buried here on our mountain. When they arrived here, they found a race of little people here, little fairy-like people, called the Patupaerehi. Māori respected them and even treated them with a little superstition, because these were the unseen people in the forest, the people they heard laughing at night and chuckling away, the people they heard rowing their small walkers across the lake at night time. And my understanding is they were uh, light-skinned, fair-skinned, with light to reddish hair. And they lived up on the mountain, on the slopes of Mount Moiho, in the mist. And they would come down the Onohi Creek, down to the sea, and there they would fish. And they usually only came out at night or when it was very misty. It is believed that when Māori came to this land, there were certain things and skills they did not have, they didn't bring with them. These are things they learnt off the Patupaherehi. Now, the making of the fishnets was something which was a bit sneaky. Um, there was a man, I think his name was Kahununu, and he was um, on a beach late one night and he became aware of a number of people fishing in the dark and pulling on what turned out to be a net. He was able to join with these people uh, pulling this net in. And it was full of fish. And as it came in, it was getting close to dawn and suddenly the people, as the first light started to shine, um, they turned around, saw that there was a person who was not one of them and also the first light of the sun in the morning is a time where Patapairehi take off back into the forest away from the sun. So they abandoned their catch, abandoned the fishing net. And this young man looked at it and said, we can use this ourselves. The Patapairehi also taught Māori the cat's cradle. Also, a Māori flute, the putarino, a very, very simple device carved from wood. And it is believed that the Patapairehi, the fairy folk of the forest, taught Māori how to make the putarino. And they were a magical people. They would bewitch people, they put a spell on them, particularly women. And they would lure the woman away with this flute, flute music. 
and they would never be seen again. And even now there's some bushmen who go up and work on the slopes of the mountain and I've heard they say when it's misty sometimes they can just hear voices, they can hear people talking. Did they exist as a small race of people or were they indeed a fairy race of people? We've been told about a place where these mythical people used to live. It's on the shores of Lake Okataina, and it's called Takotu Pa. I'll try and get out of here without doing old people noises. <laughs> I could have easily slept in there. And it's actually an adjoiner, so maybe it was a double a double home for the pre Te Arua people who would have hidden from their enemies. Archaeologists say that there are storage sheds, but my feeling is this is a village site. There are hundreds along here. There are those that are much larger, probably family size, but not for tall people. As well as the Patu Paraihe, there's another group of fair-skinned people known as the Turahu. What do we know about them? In areas like uh, Te Papakanga Park, out towards Thames, there's a Turahu village. And on the sign out there, uh, describing Maori oral traditions of the area, they uh, speak of very small people with golden hair they had a beautiful freshwater stream that ran through the village. They uh, cut a trench uh, from a higher point of the stream right across their arable land to provide water for their agriculture. In the valley, they've got two very nice amphitheaters that they've uh, carved out of the hill where the acoustics were wonderful. These simple kinds of amphitheaters are found all over New Zealand and uh, based on Maori oral traditions, the people used to go to these places like the amphitheatres and speak and sing very loudly. After visiting two archaeological sites associated with the fairy people, Te Papakanga Park and Te Kotu Pa, we now wonder if there are any historical records about them. There's a guy in our history, uh, his name was Gilbert Mir. He was well respected amongst the Māori people. And it's like this guy jumps out with his weapon in front of the whole of this platoon, which they used to call the Te Arua Flying Column, and starts jumping around and displaying his weapon and, and doing his dance. One of the guys starts loading up his musket and points at him and old Gilbert Mayer says, you know, give the man a bit of credit, you know, look what he's doing. And then as suddenly as he appeared, he disappears. He just a couple of skips into the bush and he's gone. What is sort of interesting is that this guy was fair as white, white. But the other thing was fully facial tattoo, Māori tattoo. Also the legs, everything, you know. So the interesting thing is, there's a very, very tall, white person brandishing a Māori taiaha with a fully facial tattoo, which was only for the ones of high rank. People think everyone got tattoos in the old days, they're wrong. Five to ten percent at the most. You had to be something to deserve, especially a facial tattoo. I was just about to mention old Maggie Papakuta. She was uh, probably, or is the most famous of all our guides. She was basically what you call a puhi ariki, which means very chiefly woman. Anyway, she wrote a book called The Old Time Māori, and it's probably the best reference for what went on in the old days anywhere. And it was funny to hear because when I read it, it's like she mentions waka blondes, you know? You get the word blondes because of a family in here that are all fair skinned and all blonde haired. She mentioned in this book that her best friend was a, a little girl called Putiputi. 
She was fair, she had blonde, blonde hair, and there's even a picture of her in this book. Puti Puti's father was of the Tangata Whenua or the Urikehu clans, okay, which were um, the people that were basically here before we got here, okay. Well known to be, you know, tall, fair skinned, um, definitely not little fairies. This lady, Puti Puti's father, was of that clan. They lived on top of the mountain up the back here, the most sacred of all our mountains in the whole area of Nongotaha. The name of their village was called Te Tuahu o Te Atua, which means the um, praying place of the gods. And that's basically where the Patu Paiari here lived. It's still up there. You know, we used to go out there when we were kids. And it's like, you can still see the mounds, you know, that sort of thing. And as for the um, whānau that are in here, the tōnahis, or the tōnahi, they are still around. They are all still blonde. Were these people real or not? They were. We've got a family, you know, who descend from them. Yeah. And I have three nieces who were born with, with red hair as well, but brighter than his. We've got uh, people in New Zealand who uh, were once described as the Waka Blondes. And these are people who have a different lineage than the Polynesian people. And I grew up with many of them. I knew many of them in my uh, formative years. Worked with them on work gangs. They were the people with uh, red hair, freckled faces. They were distributed throughout New Zealand. And uh, they were Maori, but they had come through a completely different lineage. And a lot of them actually have very traceable whakapapa that's much, much older than any of the uh, Polynesian Maori whakapapa. And they know where they came from. Uh, I know one uh, individual, uh, an old kuia, a very dignified lady, who uh, claims to come out of Persia. And the area that she's talking about, very close to India. And um, when we did DNA analysis on this lady, uh, it shows a high incidence of her blood group or her DNA in the Persian area. So she's quite correct. But then the second big, uh, block, if you like, of people that share her DNA are found in Peru. This is very interesting as it concurs almost exactly with a Maori legend recorded over a hundred years ago by ethnologist Elsden Best when he was living amongst the Tuhoi people. The legend tells us that their ancestors in times long passed away, 165 generations or around three and a half thousand years ago, migrated from a hot country named India. The cause of this exodus was a disastrous war with the dark-skinned folk in which great numbers were slain. This war was recorded in the Indian epic known as the Mahabharat. The legend continues on to describe their voyages which eventually took them into Polynesia. They crossed the oceans to Tafiti Roa, a long skinny land believed to be Central America, and then on to Tafiti Nui, a very large land, South America. And from there, they ventured into the scattered isles of the Pacific. This Tuhoi story describes a very different history to the one that asserts that the Polynesians came from Taiwan. And it could even turn Pacific prehistory on its head. Perhaps it's time we tracked down the lady that Martin spoke of and got her story first hand. We've always believed from the history that was handed down by Piki Te Piki Kotuku, our great great grandfather, that we came from the, this ancient place outside of Egypt named ancient Persia. Today it is named Iran or Iran, whichever way you want to say it. Well, when I told my family, oh, they were proud when I told them that they came from ancient Persia. Some of them said, oh, are we Arabs? Yeah. I said, well, actually, we'd be described as being Egyptian. 
yeah. more than Arabs. Oh, there yeah. they are. Hello. This is only some of them. Yeah. I got 64 together. <gasps> yeah, that's Expensive grandchildren, Christmas. greats and great greats. We're quite, br we're quite proud of it. Oh, gosh, why would Oh, we you? really are. This is my mum. Her name was Tangi Maria Teararo Karauti. My mother was the one that gave me the history and she wanted us to know just who we were and who we are. This is my dad. Hawani James Ham. His mother was a Waratini, and the Waratini are the blue eyed Ngati Hotu of Fakatane. This was my husband, Iki Fenua Matamua, who passed away in 2007. He is of Tuhoi descent, and they too are of Ngati Hotu. I have here a photograph of my grandmother and my grandfather, Te Araroa Karauti. And my grandmother was red-headed and she had the green eyes. And she was a very, very fair lady. This photograph is of Janet. Of my ten children, she was the only one that really resembled me. And she is the only one of my ten children that had the green eyes. But apart from that, a lot of my grandchildren do too. We couldn't believe our eyes when we first saw Monica's family. Right in front of us was a living representation of the green-eyed, golden-haired people we've been looking for. They're not just fairy folk of the forest, or mythical beings. They are real. We wonder what motivated Monica to publish her story. Well, in 2006, I was at the hearings, and this witness was saying that we were no more that Ngāti Hōtu had been wiped out, eaten out. It was quite hurtful hearing this story. And I was sitting there and I thought, oh, the hell, hell with this. I'm going to take this through the Waitangi Tribunal and prove that we still exist. And I, I gave my history and the judge at the time, which was Judge Wainwright, she put it on the internet and it went worldwide. And there was a lot of, a lot of hits came back from everywhere who knew of the people of Ngāti Hōtu and it was seen by uh, the e-local magazine who took up the story. And from there I did my DNA with the Geographical Society DNA Registrar. And that DNA was sent to America to be analysed and it proved that we were of Ngāti Hōtu and every bit of the history I gave at the Waitangi Tribunals was correct word to word. And my DNA took me you know, it went to Germany, into Russia, America, among the Inca people. Now, among, in Peru, there's a cave there. There's painting in the caves that depict the Ngāti Hōtu people being chased out and getting into their boats. But to me, from my DNA, we came straight here after leaving Peru, after mm. being driven out. In South America, there is plenty of evidence of native people with golden hair and green eyes. For example, the Oricano, the Paracas redheads, and the Chachapoya blonde-headed cloud people of the Andes. But another place I know they did go to, definitely, was, was Mexico, because in Mexico they found an ancient old tiki. So the tiki is not a Māori emblem, it belonged to the Ngāti Hōtu people. And Mexico is in my DNA. Another thing they brought with them was the, uh, the thing they put up on the tefo tefo of a man doing, you know, with his tongue hanging out and stark naked, yeah. Bess, and they could, that's right, it was named Bess. Yeah. Bit, a little bit of a joke of man. It is an Egyptian emblem. It's not Māori at all. Monica showed us this wood carving with bess on it, which was found in a swamp near Kaitaia. What caught our attention was the birdman motif at each end. This is a motif believed to be unique to Easter Island. This island, according to local legend, was discovered by a red-haired Peruvian leader, or Matua, named Hotumatua. Hotumatua, who shares Monica's tribal name, Hotu, is said to have brought 67 Orongo Orongo tablets from Peru, 
a record of their history as a nation. These were written in a script almost identical to one in the Middle East that was abandoned after a war that destroyed the Indus civilization three and a half thousand years ago. The war that forced Monica's ancestors to flee. When Dr. A. Carroll deciphered one of these tablets in 1892, it showed that it contained a record of many wars in Peru prior to Hotumatua's escape to Easter Island. The literal meaning of Hotumatua is the leader who weeps. Hardly surprising considering they'd fled the conflict in the Middle East only to be forced again to escape Peru and then end up on an isolated speck of land in the Pacific. An island that was named Tepito o Tefenua, which literally means the finish of the land. A land upon which over a thousand statues were carved as monuments to their once great nation. Hotumatua's descendants eventually went on to colonize many islands in the Pacific, taking with them South American plants such as the pineapple, pawpaw and sweet potato. They also took with them the remnants of their Middle Eastern culture. This may help solve many mysteries about the connections between the Middle East, the Americas and the Pacific. For many people, the South American connection to the Polynesians and Easter Islanders is obvious. Stonework similarities, reed surfboards, contiki-like carvings and ceremonial towers known as the Tupa in Easter Island, the Chulpa in Peru and the as yet unrecognised stone cairns of New Zealand. However, the Ronga Ronga Stone in Cornwall Park in Auckland was built in identical fashion to the Ronga village houses in Easter Island and the Chulpa of Peru. This is the Ronga Ronga Stone and um, it's come down off one of the Auckland uh, hills. Maori used to venerate particular stones uh, that had a much older lineage. Uh, they didn't necessarily, in every case, uh, know what the meaning of the stone actually was, but this one is dedicated or in veneration of the potato god. And in our museums around the Auckland area especially, we have many of the potato god statues. Also on Makoya Island, uh, there's a very, very good statue there of, of the South American potato god. Legend also has it that Orongo had red hair and was from Easter Island. When he arrived with the Kumara, where did he land? I'm in a place called Orongo Bay. Now, Orongo Bay is situated in the Bay of Islands on the east side of North Island of New Zealand. And had anybody been sailing to this location from the Eastern Pacific, this would have been a truly perfect place to land. There's mangrove forests full of fish, and food, and they would have been able to feed their people very easily. Orongo, after whom the bay is named, is one such sailor. And he is actually elevated to the level of a god in New Zealand history. He is the god of the Kumara. It is well documented that the Kumara came from South America and to this day Kumara is a staple crop in New Zealand. Underneath many of these Kumara plantations are the remnants of drainage ditches that early people used to irrigate, fertilise and gain access to their crops. The Aztecs in Central America built very similar drainage ditches. The draining of these swamps for some unknown reason in the early days, or whether they were a passage for boats, you know, to come up and 
but there was evidence on this peninsula down here of those, but due to the Coomera cultivation and the farming and operation, the, the, nothing there. But nothing apparently there. there's supposed to be still some up Ahipara, up Kaitaia. Not far inland from Orongo Bay, set amongst the Coomera fields of Northland, is a par site called Te Ahuahu. This name refers to the gods of Easter Island, Aku Aku. This is Great Mercury Island, or Ahu Ahu, where traditionally the Māori grew Kumara, which was then transported to the mainland and traded. This evidence clearly connects New Zealand to Easter Island, but are there any people who can attest to that? Yes, there are. There is a founding tribe who say they come from Easter Island, and their name is the Waitaha. They told me what they call Nas Upumari, which is chief of all chiefs. My full name is Hori Kupina Manuka Manuka, but they call me George Conley. And I come from the Kaipara here. My tubeness went right back into White Island. Where, where did they originally come from? They originally came from East Island, Rapa Nui. And then to get hit here, they called themselves Waita. You know what Waita meant beside the water? Up here, Waita started up here and went down to the South Island hunting more. Yeah, some of them did go down the South Island. Well, Waita can connect back to me because originally they lived around Taupo. Oh, my grandson. I mm. sent him to Taranaki because there were some people there from Waitaha. Okay. And he met them. And when he met this woman over in Taranaki, he said he was looking, looking at me. There is indeed a strong resemblance between these people. While we were driving around New Zealand, not only did we see signs pertaining to Easter Island, but also in both South and North Islands, the extensive evidence of Waitaha presence. Noel Hilliam added this to the Waitaha story. Oh, there, there's the, that's the Waitaha that's carbon that really yeah, Maxine found. And what, why do we think that's the Waitaha carbon? What, what, what is it about it that's Waitaha? Because it's got a five-fingered hand mm -hmm. and the style of carving and also the uh, old Waitaha lady that got hold of me, where the village was, and we go down there and exactly where Maxine found the carving. Barry Brailsford, writer and historian, has studied the oral history of the Waitaha for many years. And when this story began, when the elders called me to tell the story of Waitaha, to bring it out for the first time, they said it's a very multicultural story. It has huge strands that, that intertwine. And a lot of people won't believe a bit of it. But it's the truth of our lines. So Waitaha travelled here from Easter Island. They sailed here on Great Waka of a crew of, uh, of 170. Uh, half of them are men, half of them are women, because that's the way Waitaha moved. The other thing that excites me is that in Chile, they recovered the chicken bones from the excavation that was done there. Those bones were from a chicken that is quite unique, and the DNA goes back to Samoa and Tonga, and they laid blue eggs. And when that news came out about what that meant, the New York Times, and I've got the little article that had a, an article that said, we now know who the greatest mariners in the world were, the greatest voyagers were the Polynesians. I said that uh, voyaging canoes were that fast is that they skimmed the top of the 
waves, like a brush going through your hair. We're the offspring of those who comb the long wavy hair of Cuba. In ancient times, the ocean was not a barrier. It was used as a highway to far-flung corners of the planet, especially for people wishing to escape war-torn lands. The mainstream understanding has still got a long way to go. At the moment, the history in New Zealand for the arrival of the first people goes back a mere 800 years at the very most. But in fact, you know, if we start getting the deeper story, then Waitaha say they came here something like uh, 77 generations ago, which is, um, yeah, that's, that's nearly 2,000 years. But when they came, they said there were people already here. Well, Coupe described them as a, a fair nation of people. Everywhere he went, they were fair-skinned people. Even Māori are aware, even the government is aware. The writings of, of the likes of Coupe, when he came here, the land was already populated throughout New Zealand, wherever he went. And then when um, Toi Kairako came over from Rarotonga on the Te Pai Pai Ki Rarotonga, he described the place as being populated too. And Toi did describe them as being very fair. Mm. Well, he called them as being white actually. And they had red hair and green eyes. Toi came here looking for his grandson, Fatonga. And his, his first visit was at Auckland, and they told him that his grandson had passed through there years before. So he sailed on and he landed at Whakatane. And when he stopped there, there was already tribes living there. And there were two different tribes. There was a dark race and the Ngāti Hotu people. And only the Ngāti Hotu people fed them because they were starving. And on board his ship, he had two sisters. And these two sisters were Hinawai sisters. And these sisters married the two Ngāti Hōtu chiefs living there. And today that is our tribe. Toi married into the Ngāti Hōtu as a way of becoming an accepted member of the community. And this was fairly standard practice. It was called becoming a person of the land, or tangata whenua. It's like even the people of Altia when they got to Taranaki areas, high-ranked chiefs and princesses of the Altia canoe married, married into the two tribes that were there. Uh, they were known as Kahui Ho and Kahui Maunga, and I think these two streets down there still name that. This would make you official to the land. If you weren't tangata whenua, then you were like a visitor. Had to check in and check out, sort of thing. So it seems that intermarriage between the native redhead population and the newly arrived blackhead Polynesians formed the basis of New Zealand's heritage. This was reiterated by Napui leader David Rankin, who is quoted as saying, who were those red-headed, fair-skinned people who greeted our walkers? We can't deny our oral history. If we try to, as Māori, we're actually denying our history. There is another tribe on the East Coast, which is the Ngāti Parau, from uh, East Cape. And um, I remember I knew quite a few Ngāti Parau when I was in Wellington. And I know that there are some Ngāti Parau that are fairly fair-skinned, some even freckled, and they have red hair. Yeah, many of them are Ngāti Hōtu who were married from Arua Putuhanga. She was of Whanganui descent and she was of Ngāti Hōtu. And a lot of the people of Mania Poto and Whanganui come from her. Yeah, and I can trace my lineage back to her anyway. It appears there were many tribes descended from these light-haired people with green eyes, but despite their different genetic makeup, the Waitaha and the Ngāti Hotu have contributed dynamically to Māori culture and have formed the foundation 
of many tribes today. When we observe the Maori population today, there is little evidence of the gold-haired, green-eyed people. So what happened to them? To help us answer this question, let's look at what happened in the Central Pacific. There are legends and documented records of early explorers meeting the red-haired people throughout the Pacific. For example, when Captain Wallace on HMS Dolphin visited Tahiti in 1767, they noticed that over 10% of the population were white-skinned with golden hair especially on the islands of Huahine and Ra'iatea, a name that originally meant the white-skinned people of Ra. When Captain Cook visited Tahiti two years later, the golden-haired people had all but disappeared. He was told that they had become sick and died just after the departure of the HMS Dolphin. Could it be that these White-skinned, golden-haired people were more susceptible to European diseases than the Polynesians? This might indicate that their lack of resistance to European disease means they weren't of European origin despite their appearance. To this day, Samoans, through annual festivals, venerate their red-haired ancestors. Some of these were peace-loving, but others, under the reign of Batuku the Long Skull, were bloodthirsty cannibals who lived on a bay called the Putrefaction of Men. These cannibals would prey upon the peaceful people of Tonga and Fortuna. They particularly fancied the firstborn child. They'd noticed that the second often died, therefore the first must be much stronger. But did they misunderstand what was really happening? It is well known now that the recessive gene is often accompanied by the rhesus-negative blood group in which second children frequently die. So the red-headed blood group would have been incompatible with the Polynesian chiefs who were renowned for taking red-haired women for their wives. This would have severely curtailed the number of redheads in the Pacific. Patuku's reign of terror was brought to an end in the 13th century when Polynesian chief Savea rid Samoa of those barbarous, fair-skinned savages. Unfortunately, the peace-loving redheads of Easter Island and New Zealand may have been caught up in the aftermath of this war. This seething hatred towards the redheads resurfaced on Easter Island in 1680, when, due to a terrible famine, war broke out and all but three of Hotumatua's descendants were driven into a raging fire in the Poiki Ditch. Only one male Aurora remained to perpetuate the redheads on Easter Island who are still fighting for their survival today. Well, I know they are the, the Ngati Hotu people, they were a peaceful people. They didn't know war and fighting until the Maoris arrived. Waitaha believed to take the life of another was to destroy your own. That's where they began, that was their baseline. But between Taupo and Ruapehu, 3,000 Ngati Hotu were killed by two Whareto. Mm. And there were 600 killed here in Taumaranui by the Mania Poto people. And that was the last cannibal feast of New Zealand, it was held here at the Cherry Grove, and 600 Ngati Hotu perished.
And after the Battle of Te Porere, over to Koti, the Crown ordered anyone that was with Koti to be beheaded. So they headed back into the, the rugged parts of the Tauriwa and they were the last survivors. This picture of my grandmother, Te Oti Mihitarina, was one of the five survivors of the Tauriwa forest in the year of 1860. This is one of the caves that uh, had all the uh, skeletons of the Turiho White Heart people stacked in. There were skulls and skeletons all around here. In 1961, uh, Robinson Bone Mill came up from Only Hunger and uh, gathered them all up, paid all the workers threepence a sack. To grind up his bone dust fertiliser, and they were all shipped out of. Uh, to Copra here, the armed constabulary were there and they counted these skulls in each sack and uh, they estimated at least 60,000 skeletons were recovered from just this one region and for fortunately uh, they didn't get them all. There's a couple of caves with these fellows in. The, the coffin's about five foot long, made out of New Zealand cowrie. I was very keen to uh, <clears throat> get DNA and everything done on, you know, who were these people, where'd they come from? And I was at a conference some years ago in uh, Rotorua and there was a forensic pathologist from England. Uh, I, I was talking to him about them. He said, oh, I've got a few days after the conference, I'll come up. So he spent three days with me. I took him around these various sites and he examined these there's just one of the many sites. Of it. I took them to about five different sites. Small people? Oh yeah, yeah, about four foot, four foot three. And, and you know, well, you see the skeletons. He examined them all, measured them, and he took an eye tooth to England. And 18 months later, he says, "No, those are ancient Celtic people living in Wales three and a half thousand years ago. This is where they originated from." This is not the only genetic information that links the fair-skinned Māori to the Celts. Jean Dossé did a study on the redheads of Easter Island and found that their DNA was very close to the Basque and Welsh populations of ancient Europe. Two more recent genetic studies have confirmed his findings. Not only did they have 16% ancient European ancestry, but they also had 8% Native American DNA. You go back to the islands, you're not going to see the swirling, the intertwining things, you know? Where does this come from? And it's like, man, I could translate that and make it look exactly like a Celtic pattern. You know, so we had to be influenced by peoples or surroundings that we're already here. We had at least three distinct groups of the Patupayarahe. Some were very, very tall. They seemed to occupy the whole west coast and areas inland. I think their, their big skulls have been found over at Otrahonga in the uh, limestone country. Whenever these uh, skeletons are found, uh, they're turned over to iwi and destroyed. Martin went on to tell us about the Raglan Giants. So we're heading there now to see what we can find. When we arrived at Raglan Harbour, we noticed some flat-topped hills that according to the local Maori were fashioned by red-haired giants. These people also lived on the coast at the foot of their sacred mountain, Karioi. In a battle with the marauding Tainui, they were driven over the edge at Tototo Gorge and their bones littered the base of the cliffs. We were told giant skulls could still be found hidden in the crevices and caves along the Raglan shoreline. A 
it is said their heads were the size of pumpkins and their jaws could fit around one's own with over an inch to spare. Just north of Raglan is Port Waikato, where similar skeletons have been found. There are uh, two major caves in the Port Waikato area where the great big skeletons are supposed to have been found in the 1800s. And there have been a number of articles and that about them. But uh, I think a female skeleton out there was somewhere in the vicinity of seven foot or a little bit over. And there were some male skeletons found that were taller than that. People who actually went into the cave reported that there were skeletons way down in the cave, which were quite, of quite tall humans. And also they had remnants of red hair on their skulls. Uh, we have researched that area ourselves, trying to find A, the location of the cave which they covered in, but over a long period of time, how would you ever be able to find where they'd blown the, the, the cave up and there's no one around today that can tell us. In our search for skeletons, we heard about a cave burial on the shores of Lake Okataina. We were told there were two bound skeletons guarding a canoe surrounded by poisonous tutu berries. In the canoe lay a cloaked red-haired chief wearing a large tiki. After a painstaking scramble through ancient Kawa Kawa forest past giant puriri and karaka trees, we finally found it only to discover that almost everything had been destroyed except for a small section of a highly decorated burial canoe. We have just had a conversation with an excavator driver. He was doing an excavation up in Northland and he was clearing the ground and he saw what he thought looked like um, some white footballs in the ground. So he cleared a little bit around these white footballs and found them to be skulls. He didn't feel good about this at all. So he called the Auckland Museum and there he was told by a person that there was absolutely nothing they could do at the museum because the local iwi or tribes had no interest in these skeletons because they were not of their era or of their clan and that so tied was the curator's hands that he explained to our digger driver friend that there were over 2,000 of these skeletons that have been found hunched in a fetal position and bound and yet buried north of Russell in a place called Awanui and they simply had to be excavated over the top of. There was nothing they could do. Our question is, good gracious me, what are these skeletons? Who were they? And why were they being destroyed? I mean, for goodness sake, if you touch a skull today, you're up for a huge fine, possibly even a prison sentence. What is going on that it was all right to, to just continue excavating over the top of these skeletons? This almost seems, well, A, it's hypocritical, but B, it's almost criminal. In 1981, the New Zealand, uh, the government called in the New Zealand Forest Service and the Land and Survey to survey all the stonework up in the Waipua there because they were going to clear fell. There had been a lot of uh, pine trees planted on the western side of the Waipua. And uh, so there was a team of um, 36, I was the 37th archaeologist. We were up there for well, over 12 months doing the work up there. And then the initial dating came through, 2225 BC. And the Maori guy that was in charge 
Next day he closed the whole operation down. There was over half a million dollars of taxpayers' money spent on this archaeological thing. All the findings, mapping, all the work we'd done was deposited in the National Archives in Wellington with a hold on for 75 years. And Gary Cook successfully got some of them released a few years ago, but all the carbon datings that all disappear. Go. There's a, one of the walls that we exposed up in the wide power there, and the top of that wall was ground level. So it's been closed down now. Oh so yeah. You can't <coughs> go into that forest at all. Oh yeah. You go and you might never come back out. So it looks like going into the Waipua forest is out of the question. Luckily, there are other places around the country similar to the Waipua site that can still be seen. The Auckland Airport, Te Papakanga Park and on a farm in Northland. Here, we were shown around by Vince, a local farmer. When I first came here, some of these piles were round straight sides, some were square, straight sides, some were oblong. They all, if they, nearly all dead straight sides, very loosely constructed, as you can see, you can see right through into them, see the small pebble stones inside yep. them? Yep. That's how loosely constructed they are. Watch they don't fall down on you, love. Because they don't take much to fall down. As you can see, the balls yeah. have broken a bit. Have, have broken them easily, yeah. And when I first saw them, some were flat, dead flat across the top with big stones, and some were piles going up to a cone on the top. The similarity between the Chulpa of Peru and what Vince is describing is pretty obvious. But why is this information not public knowledge? Who's hiding what and why? So there's been archaeologists out here looking at these things? In the past, about 35 years ago apparently. I don't and what are they, they didn't, what I'm are they saying? I'm not sure what they've come up with really. We were told that they've... Um, they dug down? That they have unearthed over 70 mounds. There's an estimated over 3,000 mounds here. Um, we were told that they'd unearthed over 70 of them. They found no ash, they found no bone. There's no soil. There's been no evidence of roots or anything in them. What they built those fences for, whether they were keeping animals or birds, well, there was no real animals, poultry or something in, in these combined areas, but we never actually got down because the whole whole site was closed down. And you yeah. can't go in there now? Oh, hell no. Like, uh, I was on the Northern Regional Committee here, the New Zealand Historic Places Trust, for over 25 years. And uh, when these datings came along to the, our quarterly meeting up in Kerry, Kerry there, the chairman got up and said, you're not to say or do anything at all about them. I said, thanks, God, I'm thinking very much and I resign here and now on the spot. I won't have anything more to do with the Hysterical Places Trust. But through, through the cover-up of what happened in the Waipua, mm. this uh, uh, and guy did hand in his ticket. One, one of the honest guys that, you know, yeah. knew the facts and that and this bullshit that goes on. And My particular generation and those before me here in New Zealand were raised with a particular kind of history. And uh, it's in all of our old history books. Uh, Maori, Kumatwas, Tohungas uh, were very open about their history and uh, they shared it um, with the colonial anthropologists or archaeologists who came through. And uh, you found that the old people, uh, if they thought you were worth talking to, would take you aside and they'd tell you all the old stories. So we just knew what the history of the country was directly from the uh, Maori Kuiers and elders themselves. Came back to New Zealand in uh, 1974 and noted that there was sort of a, an enforced amnesia being put over the people of the country where um, we just weren't allowed to know that old history anymore. And uh, it seems we were being led to forget all of that uh, for somebody's political agenda or for political expediency. And um, I knew it to be false and um, I watched as our older history books were um, taken off the shelves of the libraries 
and uh, replaced by sort of a new wave of Marxist history books uh, that uh, negated all of that uh, former truth. And mind you, all these books that have been written up of Ngāti Hōtu, they all go to the fiction, fiction shelf to me today. We've kept our history to ourselves. We would never have told it. No use telling it, because no one would believe you. Mm. Yeah, they just think you're a crank and a <laughs> nutty, a nut pot. But the, this is what, what is going on, you know. Our institutions and the brainwashing is going on. They've rewritten New Zealand's history. From Wellington? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's, that's uh, Iwi or...? Oh, it's a governmental, departmental control. They don't want anything pre-Maori or pre-Tasman to, to come out. It was easier to sweep us under the carpet. Of course, today our fight is really against the Crown, not the Waitangi Tribunal itself, or the people. You can't blame the people when they've got, you know, when they go, they, they've got the power behind them. If we could have a Royal Commission inquiry and get the true, you know, academics in New Zealand and, and the groundwork people, do a complete, all the evidence is there. As Noel says, it is imperative that we have a Royal Commission to make public this vital history that at present is being denied. There's no doubt that there were earlier people living here who were either red or golden haired. Now what would it take to give the Ngāti Hōtu and the Waitaha people back their rightful position and place as the foundation of Māori culture in New Zealand and stop this fascinating history from being lost forever? Kia tū ngā manā ki tāngā e te au 